So just as a reminder, this is being recorded and we will put it on the College of Sciences website. Uh, again, if you just little instructions, make sure your video's off and that you're muted. Uh, if you have any issues throughout the, the presentation, you can go to the help center at support.zoom.us. Also, uh, we will be doing questions at the end of the session. So put any questions you might have in the chat box. I'll ask them to, to Dr. O to Ed afterwards. Um, after the presentation, we'll make sure that we address as many of those as we can. Um, and lastly, we are recording. So just a reminder that we are recording the session. Welcome everyone to Virtual Lab Notes. We're excited to have you. Uh, this is our first late afternoon session. We normally do this at lunch, so we're, we're demoing a new time. Uh, but thanks you, thanks all of you for joining us. Uh, we're very excited to have Dr. Edwin O oh from the UNLV School of Medicine. It's actually the Kirk Kikorian School of Medicine at UNLV now. We're very excited about that. And also from the Nevada Institute of Personalized Medicine. Uh, but before I introduce uh, Dr. O, oh, I'm gonna give a quick plug for next month's lecture topic. Uh, so join us for next month's virtual lab notes. We'll have Dr. Pamela Burnley. She's a professor in the UNLV Department of Geoscience here in the College of Sciences. We haven't nailed down a topic yet, but I think it will be focused on earthquakes, uh, especially here in the Las Vegas area. So it should be quite fascinating. Uh, so join us, you'll get email announcements and such uh, later on, but please join us. And without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our, our speaker for this month, Dr. Edwin O, that, that was the topic of getting dirty, using wastewater to understand the spread of human disease. So Dr. O uh, received his PhD in neuroscience from the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor in 2008. Following a postdoctoral fellowship at Johns Hopkins University, he served as an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at Duke University. And Dr. O is currently an associate professor in the School of Medicine and the Nevada Institute of Personalized Medicine. Funding during Dr. O's tenure includes a Rackham Predoctoral Fellowship, Fight for Sight Postdoctoral Fellowship, NARSAD Young Investigator Award, NIH R01, P2O, and P50 grants, and several collaborative NIH grants. And he is absolutely stellar. We're very lucky to have him here at UNLV, and I will let him take it away. Thank you so much, Corey, for that really nice pre presentation, introduction, um, and thank you everyone for uh, for joining us uh, for this conversation. I, I know it's late. I, I, will, um, I will try not to be uh, too, um, um, go into too much detail for, for the science, but rather I'm hoping over the next, gosh, 30 or 40 minutes to sort of paint that broad picture of what um, we've been trying to accomplish over the last uh, seven or eight months together with a number of fantastic collaborators uh, in the state and also in Arizona and um, across a number of different countries in the world. So I'm gonna now share my screen. Let's see if this works. Okay. Let's see. Okay, are you are you seeing the main screen or are you seeing the transition slides? I can never tell. So we're seeing the transition slides like you're in presentation mode. Okay, all right. So let me swap the displays. How's that? Better. Yep, that's perfect. Okay. All right. Let me try and orient myself. This is a little different, but where are we? Okay. There we go. Okay. All right. Well, again, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us for this conversation. Um, my name is Ed. I'm an associate professor at the UNLV Nevada Institute of Personalized Medicine and the Department of Internal Medicine um, in the UNLV School of Medicine. Um, as I mentioned earlier, today I'm hoping to share really some of the um, newest data that's been coming out of the lab over the last uh, seven or eight months, wherein we've um, used human clinical samples and wastewater samples uh, to track COVID-19 uh, in uh, Nevada. Oh gosh, okay. Probably don't want to go there. Let's 
So, uh, you know, a, a lot of this work was made possible by the fantastic collaborators that we have in the state and, and also in Arizona, at least for the stories that I'm going to be sharing with you today. None of this work really would have been possible if it weren't for um, the fantastic collaborations with folks in the Southern Nevada Water Authority, more specifically, Dan Garrity and Katerina Papp. Um, and together with the health district and folks up in uh, Reno with the public health uh, state uh, lab, state health lab and um, UNR, um, we've been able to look at COVID-19 genomes from wastewater and also from, um, from humans to better understand what might be going on in our state. And I'll also be discussing some of the things that we've been doing with Arizona. We've also been very fortunate uh, to be funded by um, a number of organizations and without, uh, without their support, um, again, none of this would have been possible. So uh, the, this uh, is the brave group of individuals who, who really um, made uh, the science in our lab um, um, uh, move in the way that it has over the last, gosh, eight, nine months. And most of the COVID-19 work in the lab has really been driven by this talented postdoc here, Dr. Van Vo. Um, to go, together with Dr. Van Vo in the lab, um, we've also had the privilege of a number of outstanding undergraduate students. Um, for example, Lani Chang has really um, helped us think about different ways to profile um, SARS-CoV-2 by using uh, protein samples instead of RNA samples. We've also um, um, been supported by uh, Richard Gu and Haley Baker, who played a really important role in the preparation of samples um, before we bring them into the lab, into the sequencing lab to generate libraries and then uh, run the analysis. Um, in addition to folks in the lab, we also are supported by the genome um, acquisition and analysis lab um, that is funded by a personalized medicine COBRE at UNLV. And here, Shirley Shen has helped us um, think about different ways of developing the sequencing libraries. And also um, she's um, been instrumental in getting all of our uh, libraries sequenced. And uh, Richard Tillett is a bioinformatician um, and he is the key person in um, running all of the analyses for us when we analyze uh, human clinical genomes and also wastewater material. Uh, Rick Young, a graduate student, uh, recently won a, an award from UNLV for developing a wastewater dashboard for the community to better understand where we are with viral concentrations. And we're also supported by Corey, um, who was providing a lot of bioinformatic um, um, expertise. So <clears throat> my lab has, has traditionally been interested um, uh, sorry, Corey. Uh, I, I'm the host now, is that right? Yes, you should be. Okay, because I, I, so I'm, I'm admitting people too. Oh, <laughs> sorry <laughs> about that. Not a problem, not a problem, I, I could do that. Um, I just need to get, get, get out of my pointer. Hang on a second. Uh, I think that worked. Okay, um, so, so my lab has been traditionally interested in uh, studying a, a structure known as the primary cilium and, um, in, and understanding how this uh, structure uh, plays a role in development and disease. Now, one of the main reasons for this interest is that we know that mutations in genes whose protein products are required to form this structure that you see here on the right, or that are required for the function of this structure shown here on the right, we know that mutations in these genes can give rise to a whole host of phenotypes in rodent models. So when you generate a knockout mouse or when you find a mutant naturally um, in the environment, we see that these genes can contribute to these phenotypes shown here, ranging from hearing loss to anosmia or the loss of smell to retinal degeneration due to the loss of rod and cone photoreceptors to changes in the face or craniofacial abnormalities uh, to polydactyly or the extra digits um, to infertility. And so 
while we were discovering a number of these different uh, mutant mouse models, we were also, well, we and others were also working with clinicians around the world, with clinicians around the world to, to ask um, that simple question, whether if you can find these mutations in mouse models, in mammals, can you also find uh, similar mutations in humans with the same phenotypes? And the short answer is yes. We can indeed find uh, individuals with the same mutations and the same genes that are giving rise to the host of phenotypes I showed you with the rodents. And this again can range from the uh, uh, polydactyly to the hearing loss to the retinal degeneration um, that we see in mouse models. So really, I think um, what, what the last uh, 10 years or so has given us in terms of new technological advances is the ability to use next generation sequencing tools to discover mutations that cause diseases. So for the ciliopathies, we can find that a single mutation in a human being can cause what we call a relatively mild ciliopathy in which we see um, the impact of that mutation on one organ system. So for in the instance of nephronathysis, we see renal pathology or kidney dysfunction versus a more severe type of um, um, disease, a ciliopathy, um, such as Meckel-Gruber syndrome, where a single mutation can cause uh, death shortly after birth. So given the tools that we've been working with really over the last 10, 15 years, um, pretty much a year ago, uh, the lab found itself asking this uh, important question for us. Can we use those same genomic tools, the next generation sequencing tools that we've been so used to using to better understand how this virus, SARS-CoV-2, causes COVID-19? To answer this question, I think our first Eureka moment really came about when, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, when we met Dan Garrity over in the Southern Nevada Water Authority. Dan works together with Katerina Papp to analyze um, the water in Southern Nevada. And Dan was already five steps at least ahead of us. And as you can see here in this graph, let me orient you to this graph, the x-axis is time, the y-axis on the left is the number of cumulative cases, and the y-axis on the right is showing the number of new cases. What you're seeing here over time is this red line with the increasing number of cases over two months um, of March 5th, 2020 to May 28th, 2020. And these blue bars here represent uh, new cases uh, during this point in time. And really the key point for us here was this black line here. And what Dan and Katerina had shown was that SARS-CoV-2 could be detected in the wastewater as early as March of last year in Southern Nevada. And what they were able to show, Dan and Katerina, was that there was an increasing amount of this virus that corresponded to the number of cases in our community. This was huge for us, right? Because we thought if you can detect the virus in this sample, well, we should be able to sequence it. And boy, was I wrong. Um, really, over the next five or six months, we had to spend a lot of time, uh, um, a lot of time preparing the right types of reagents to uh, extract the virus out from the wastewater. We had to uh, develop new tools to be able to prepare sequencing libraries for this virus. And then we had to develop the right tools to analyze the sequencing data that we were getting from these analyses. So it really took a whole bunch of people working day and night to figure this out. And I think we've gotten closer to the answer. Let me admit a person real quick. Okay. Sorry about that, Ed. No worries, not, not no worries at all. <laughs> I just, um, so, uh, so the concept of detecting a virus in wastewater 
is not necessarily a novel concept. Many of you may be familiar with this condition, poliomyelitis. Well, uh, back pretty much in the uh, 20th century, uh, many clinicians were studying this condition and we knew that this condition was caused by a virus called poliovirus. And so many clinicians had already characterized this condition as being an infectious disease that resulted in uh, perhaps a lot of people not having visible symptoms. This is rather intriguing, right? Because 72 out of 100 people who get infected don't show visible symptoms. They're asymptomatic. In addition, an infected person can spread this virus to others before and after symptoms appear. So again, when you're uh, asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic, symptomatic, you can spread this disease. Now the symptoms of um, polio can vary from something that's relatively mild with cold-like symptoms to life-threatening paralysis. This was rather unique for polio. Um, in addition, there's latent infection where physical symptoms may emerge much later in death after infection. And finally, here's really the key point to us that, um, that polio and wastewater surveillance was telling us. This is a disease, polio, that can be spread by respiratory and fecal routes, right? So what this um, informed us about was that if you have an infectious disease, if you have a condition that's shed through fecal material, you can probably detect it using wastewater or sewage. So here's a report in 2000 from a group in Japan. And what this group did was they analyzed the different subtype groups of polioviruses that could be isolated from river water and from sewage. Again, let me orient you to this graph. What you're seeing here in the x-axis is time. So the number of uh, different months in 1993, 94, and 95. And what you're seeing here in the y-axis is the number of isolates, potentially the number of subtypes was what these authors were trying to get at back then. And so if you look specifically in November 1993, this group could show that there were three different subtypes of polio in circulation in Japan. And after um, this identification in November, you start to see uh, the um, findings that decrease over time and you see this pick back up in May, June, July, and you see it go down, back up again in October, November, go back down, and then again you see it during the summer in Japan. So this is key data for us because not only can you detect polio in wastewater, you can detect subtypes for us. So I hope you can sort of see where I'm going with this logic. You can potentially detect new emerging variants of this virus, even 20, 21 years ago. So as many of you know, one of the challenges for COVID-19 is the testing paradigms that we have in place. And the reason that this is a challenge for many of us uh, across the world is that similar to polio, COVID-19 cases are asymptomatic. A large fraction of these cases are asymptomatic. So if you have individuals who are not showing symptoms, it's hard to get these individuals tested. So we wondered to ourselves, given the challenges of COVID-19, given the, given the uh, genomic tools that were already available for other infectious diseases, could we develop a surveillance system that was efficient and relatively inexpensive to track a pathogen. So over the next uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, I'd like to share with you uh, uh, four different short stories that, um, that we've developed. I, again, a, a lot of this data is uh, quite fresh and we're in the process of publishing this right now. But in the first short story, I'd like to share with you some of our data on how we've been able to identify viral concentration and variants in Southern Nevada. In the next uh, short story, I'd like to discuss how we've done this for discrete small residences like a dormitory in Arizona. 
And then in the third part, I'd like to talk about a uh, Reno uh, strain that we too have developed in Las Vegas. And finally, I'd like to end this off with um, this idea that if you can detect um, a virus from an infectious disease from wastewater, if you can detect a single isolate, you can probably detect all actionable pathogens that cause human diseases in this environmental resource. Thus, this can act like an early warning system. So this is a graph that I shared with you um, early on, right? So in this first short story about how we've been able to detect viral concentrations and variants um, in Southern Nevada, um, I first uh, shared with you that we can detect that that virus uh, is present in our wastewater. We can detect that binary outcome. Is it there? Is it not there? Given that we can do this for one facility, we naturally then want to ask that question. Well, if we can look at a wastewater treatment plant that services something like 600,000 people, surely we can do this for multiple facilities. And um, that's exactly what we've been doing really over the last gosh, nine months now. Uh, not every facility has been studied in as, um, as much depth as the others, but we've looked at more or less nine facilities and we found similar patterns. And those patterns are shown here in this figure. So in the x-axis for panel E, um, we're plotting time from July 28th to approximately April of this month, this year. On this y-axis, we're plotting the number of new cases. And on this y-axis, we're plotting the wastewater uh, viral concentrations that we're measuring. And so the trends that we're observing across the facilities are really similar in that anytime we see a decrease or an increase of the concentration of the virus in wastewater, we also see similar trends in the uh, wastewater. I'm, I'm sorry, if we see new clinical cases in the community, we also see similar changes in the concentration of the virus in the wastewater. So now that we can do this for all of the different facilities, now that we can measure the concentration in Las Vegas or in Henderson, um, as I mentioned earlier on, Rick Young, a graduate student in the lab, then developed this dashboard, this fairly real-time dashboard that allows us to track for increases and decreases of viral concentrations across various zip codes. And so this is a dashboard that's active um, um, pretty much on a weekly basis using data that comes from the Southern Nevada Water Authority from Dan and from Katarina. Now, um, so what I've shown you so far is data indicating that we can detect this concentration, this viral concentration from wastewater. What about variants of interest? What about mutations in the virus? After all, this was what we really wanted to do from the get-go. We wanted to use our next generation sequencing tools to better understand this virus we didn't anticipate that we would need these tools right away and the virus would mutate this fast, but we're, um, we're, we're quite um, I'm satisfied with the, with the progress that we've made in the lab and being able to detect uh, variants using wastewater um, in the lab. So why do we want to detect these variants? Well, the CDC has put out this information of various uh, variants that might be of interest. Uh, to communities across the world. In this third uh, category here, a variant of high consequence, it's quite fortunate that we have not reached this point yet where a SARS-CoV-2 variant is one that can defeat all medical countermeasures like vaccines um, and or monoclonal antibody therapies. So really we're using our sequencing efforts to catalog the variants of interest and the variants of concern in our communities in Southern Nevada. And so a variant of concern is one that's been proven to be more contagious. And also there's lab data showing that there's reduced efficacy of vaccines against um, these types of variants. Variants of interests are those that have not been um, studied in um, great depth, um, but have mutations that suggest that it might be more contagious or that vaccines might be less efficacious. 
So many of you have probably seen um, this list of variants of interest. The known genetic variants of SARS-CoV-2, at least some of them are listed here. And what you're uh, seeing in this table is, for example, a variant known as B117. Um, this variant was first discovered in the United Kingdom and was demonstrated to be more contagious. And there appeared to be um, minimal ability to evade the vaccine from data in the lab. And um, as a result, the CDC um, has classified this variant as a variant of concern or a VOC. As you go down this list, you see the same thing. We have variants that have been discovered in South Africa, in Brazil, in New York, in California. And all of these different variants have um, been studied uh, um, in terms of whether they're thought to be more contagious and whether they could potentially evade a vaccine. Um, the, uh, the, the progress in which we're observing variants right now is it's quite staggering. We, we've been looking at all of these variants and new variants of uh, concern have been, have been identified um, pretty much uh, every month. Let me just admit someone real quick. Okay. So, so we've been seeing a lot of these different variants show up in our community. Okay, so given that we've been able to see all of these variants around the world. Hey, I'm sorry, Corey, I, there's a, um, I, th <laughs> I think there's an individual who's trying to get in from the waiting room, but I clicked on admit like five times, um, but it keeps showing up. Um, okay, uh, I don't wanna move me back as the host because I don't want your PowerPoint to drop off. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. I, I just don't know if there's something else that's showing on your uh, on your side. I'm not seeing anything. Okay. Um, let me check my email and see if someone has emailed me with an issue. Hang on. Oh. Um, hmm. Okay, this individual I'm, is Alan Gaddy. Um, okay, I'll try and see if I can reach out to him. Thanks. <laughs> but I clicked on admit, I think like 10 times now and it doesn't. Okay, I'll, I'll email him. Thank you. No worries. Okay, so um, given that we can detect all of these variants across the world, uh, what, what, what types of variants do we have in Southern Nevada? And what is our capacity to identify these different variants in uh, Southern Nevada? So um, this is a busy uh, table with all of the different counties and the rates of um, sequencing that we've been able to observe in January and February and March of this year. The uh, part of this table that I'd really like um, 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 the group to focus on is this, uh, are the stats, the statistics for Clark County, where in January we've looked at probably one, we've sequenced about 1% of all the different viral genomes. We've sequenced about 2% in February and about a little bit more than 3%. So the good thing is the number is increasing. The percentage of viral genomes is increasing. However, I think you get the notion that we're not sequencing enough uh, viral genomes right now to be able to fully track the emergence of new um, viral uh, um, um, variants. So this is data, uh, importantly, this is data from uh, Meg Dietrich and Mark Pandori from uh, the Public State Lab up in Reno. Uh, we too have been sequencing viral genomes here in Clark County. And this has been a collaboration together with the public health labs in Southern Nevada with Michael Picker and Aaron uh, Buttery. And uh, together, what we've been able to see in January of 2021 is that a large fraction of lineages 
um, in Southern Nevada are really um, what's shown here in green, B1429 and B1427. So 26.6 plus 6.3, we're seeing about 32.9% of all lineages in January belong to this category. Um, for some of you, you might know that B1429 matches up to the variant that was discovered in California. So this is a variant that's of uh, concern, primarily because of mutations that are present in the spike protein that is thought to then impact how this virus can bind to the ACE2 receptor in human cells. And um, another reason that it's a variant of concern is that the uh, US government has decided that a number of different monoclonal antibodies are not going to work for the types of mutations that are present in this variant. So we're seeing a lot of um, this variant present in Southern Nevada. If you look over here to the right, we also see about 2% of all the viral genomes in January 2021 belong to this category of B117. B117, again, is the variant that was first identified in the United Kingdom. And as many of you may already know, uh, a number of scientists have been Uh, as many of you already know, many scientists across the world have already been discussing how B117 is probably going to be the most prevalent strain in the world, um, pretty much within the next month. So as of January, based on our sequencing efforts, we were only seeing 2%. We had sequenced clinical samples from December and from November, and we did not see B117. Given this sequencing effort of clinical genomes, we then wanted to ask whether we could do the same with wastewater samples. And here's a really uh, important key uh, data point for our group that took maybe six or seven months uh, to develop. What I'm showing you here at the top is a cartoon Corey, is that you? I, or it seems like there's another. Um, it's not. Let me look at the participants. Oh, it's fine. I just see my mouse moving in two different spots on, on my screens. But uh, oh. anyway. No, go ahead. OK. Um, so what you're seeing here at the top of your screen is a cartoon of the virus, of, this, of the structure of the virus. So the virus is 30,000 nucleotides and it's made up of these different cassettes. Um, and here is the cassette that belongs to the spike protein that's thought to help this virus bind to cells, uh, to human cells. So for B117, what we're seeing here um, at the top of the screen um, is 17 different mutations that belong to this lineage. These are the characteristic mutations that belong to B117. We know this because when we sequence a patient sample, we can see those uh, mutations also show up in the sample. We can also take a synthetic genome and we can also see that it shows up, that these mutations also show up when we sequence this synthetic genome. So now when we look at all of the different facilities, we start to see these variants that belong to B117 show up. And the really key point for us is right here. Uh, the, the really key point for, you know what, let me try it. The really key point for us is here. When you look at the dates in which we're identifying these characteristic mutations, we're finding B117 in the sewage as early as in December from various facilities. And we start to see this um, frequency increase over time across space in different facilities. Now, given that we can do this, that we can identify these characteristic mutations using wastewater for B117, we can also do this for other variants. And so naturally we started looking at all of the known variants and we specifically focus on the variant that was found in California, B1427, B1429. Now there are six characteristic mutations that you can find in this variant. 
and the variants, the mutations in this lineage um, that are uh, a little bit more important um, for us um, are these three different mutations that are found on Spike. Again, for the same reason that I mentioned before, this can impact the uh, binding of the virus to the ACE2 receptor. And again, you can see that when we start looking at the various different facilities, we can detect the virus as early as December of 2020. So the key point to us here is that the detection of these viral genomes can actually be sooner than the actual detection from clinical samples. We have the means to be able to predict the types of variants that are going to show up in the next week, in the next month, and potentially in the next year, depending on how good clinical sequencing is being done in a city, in a country, in a state of uh, interest. So we can detect the concentration, we can detect the presence of these variants. So the next thing we wanted to do together with Dan was to better understand whether or not the, um, the confirmed cases in a city like ours was accurate. We know that we've been able to identify 10% of Southern Nevada that are positive, that have been sequenced and uh, quantitative PCR, gone through tests to show that this virus is present in this human being. We know that 10% of Southern Nevada have been infected. Is this number uh, an inflated number or is this number an underestimation of what's going on in a city like ours? So what we did was we plotted here uh, facility one. We looked at the daily flow of this facility. So there's 100 million gallons per day that flow in this facility. This facility services about uh, 900,000 people. This is the type of sample that we have. And using viral concentrations from the sample, we can then estimate the number of infections from wastewater in this sewer shed in this area servicing about 900,000 people. And what this gives us um, is about 39% of the population that have been infected. We've also included sero, sero prevalence uh, data from CDC from Southern Nevada. And what we're seeing is about a fourfold increase, at least in one of these facilities. We can run the same type of math and modeling for all of the different facilities and the number that we get here for all of these different facilities, which pretty much makes up a lot, if not most of Southern Nevada, Clark County, um, is that about 36% of the population down here has been infected versus the 10% of confirmed cases that we've seen. So in summary, um, I, I hope I've been able to uh, convince you that uh, wastewater can be used to study viral transmission in communities. And it's not so much a whether it can or cannot be used now, but rather how well can we implement this system to provide that type of early warning system for a residence that is either relatively small or relatively large. What we've also been able to um, um, demonstrate, I think, is that we've been able to implement next generation sequencing to track established and emerging variants. A number of different groups around the world are trying to do this, but I think right now um, our publication may be the first one to demonstrate that you can identify variants of concern and you can complement this by the sequencing of uh, clinical cases to show that the wastewater is indeed predicting the emergence of this variant. Um, so the key point that I wanna make is that wastewater sequencing should not, cannot be done alone. It really has to be done together with sequencing of clinical cases so that we can see how um, these predictions are really um, playing out. And in, in addition, contact tracing should be there. And finally, at least for this study, um, I, I think a key point that we're stressing on is that we can model the total number of infections. We predict, we see it already, that testing is going to decline over time. 
And so we're now more curious about what the significance might be for total case numbers. We, we've been seeing total case numbers fall down, but we've been seeing wastewater samples stay quite consistently high. So a bigger question to us now that we're thinking about is not really the total number of cases that we're witnessing, but the number of hospitalizations. So in the second story that I'd like to share with you, um, how do you now go about using next generation sequencing tools to look at discrete small um, residences like a dormitory? Um, as I shared with you in the previous story, we can run this type of surveillance program with a facility that is as large as a wastewater treatment plant. And so a question to us is, well, if you can do it for something this big, can you also do it for something this small, where only one person might be able to go in to a sewer and pick out a sample? And I think the answer is yes, we can do it for something that small. Here is a timeline of a story um, that we've been working uh, with, uh, with our collaborators in Arizona. So uh, back in fall 2020, many universities were reopening and a number of schools implemented wastewater uh, surveillance to better understand whether students were getting infected um, before they would even get tested. And so in the University of Arizona, the type of program that was implemented um, is shown here, wherein in August 17, students started moving into the dorm. And during this time, wastewater surveillance collection from at least 20 different buildings and dormitories was being conducted. And so in the next day and the following days after students started uh, moving in, now remember many students that were moving in where you had this type of surveillance program, many of these students were being tested first before they moved in. So we knew they were negative. And so the, the wastewater um, we felt um, was in line with the initial observations. However, when the largest influx of students started coming in later on, it was a little harder to control that type of information. And especially when classes started and everyone had moved in, what you'll notice here in, on August 25th is that the first wastewater hit was registered. On that day that that um, wastewater um, result came about, a task force met in the university to uh, define what was going to be the next step. And what they decided was that there needed to be at least a few more positive hits before any action should take place. And so on August 26, after sampling five different times in the morning, the task force decided that all 300 individuals, 300 or so individuals in this building needed to be tested. And what was discovered after clinical testing was two individuals were asymptomatic, but infected with SARS-CoV-2. They were then removed and uh, quarantined for their safety. On the next day, we observed that the wastewater was negative for SARS-CoV-2. And on the next day again, negative before one person um, who was known to be infected returned. And we saw another wastewater positive result. Uh, individuals were again tested and the individual was removed before we started seeing wastewater negative results. Now, we wanted to know whether we could sequence these genomes that were uh, potentially identified here from persons A and person B. And long story short, we were able to identify um, to at least two viral genomes from this sewage. This is a phylogenetic tree showing um, how uh, this virus has evolved over time. And really the main purpose of this uh, circle here is that you can identify at least this one strain here, 2A20268G, and you can also identify a 20C uh, genome in, um, in these samples on that day. So we could identify at least two viral genomes. Now, why is this important? Take a dormitory building, for example, that's maintained and, um, and, and monitored by wastewater surveillance. If you identify a viral genome here, you would like to then match that viral genome back up to the individual who's infected, right? Because you want to know that that index individual is going to now be quarantined and removed for their safety. 
And that way, um, the other students or other residences can be potentially uh, protected from these infections. We don't, we, we didn't um, go back to these viral genomes um, from the uh, students to verify that it matched up. But this is something that we're implementing really over the next year, where we can now go from that wastewater viral genome back to the individual, right? And the reason that we want to do this is that we want to be sure that that index individual matches up to that viral genome in the wastewater in order to track local transmission. We know that the dorm is a place that's very dynamic, right? Students are coming in from other dorms that, that don't live there. Um, parents are coming in, brothers, sisters, boyfriends, girlfriends, um, workers, right? So, when you run a system like this, when you run a surveillance program like this, you might end up analyzing all 300 individuals and get a negative result. And you might look at your wastewater surveillance program and think, oh gosh, it doesn't work. But the reality is that you might actually have other individuals who use the facilities and then left, right? So you wanna be sure that your sample from the wastewater matches up. So um, given some of these findings where we've been able to look at large wastewater treatment plants, we've been able to look at a residence hall. Um, we now are working together with the health district and the Clark County School District to uh, monitor SARS-CoV-2 levels in elementary schools. We're looking at regions where there's higher vaccination rates and lower vaccination rates because we wanna better understand whether children might be unwitting vectors for this virus. And so this is, um, this is a, a project that we've been planning for some time, and it looks like it's something that we're going to be able to implement as soon as next week. In addition to working together with CCSD, we've been working with a number of different groups around the world to look at airports, to think about airplanes, right? For a city like ours, that's an international destination for tourists, we wanna know when a virus shows up that's potentially going to be a variant of interest or a variant of concern. And if you're monitoring this wastewater, we think we have the sensitivity and specificity to get down to such details. And obviously, finally, we're looking towards implementing a program where we can monitor the viral load and the types of variants in the strip and local businesses, right? If you can do this, for a dormitory, you can do this for a homeless shelter, you can do this for a nursing home, you can do this for a casino, a hotel, a convention center, a stadium, a Walgreens, a Walmart, right? The list goes on in being able to know what is present in terms of infectious disease in the variant in your community. And so in the third short story, this is one slide really to highlight the fact that um, back in middle of last year, um, our collaborator, uh, Subhash Verma up in um, UNR was able to show that Reno for some strange reason um, had this uh, um, um, unique mutation in viral genomes that were being sequencing, uh, that were being sequenced up in Reno. We've now looked at our wastewater samples here in Southern Nevada, and we also see this type of mutation and some slight differences um, in that, uh, um, in that uh, position um, for this genome. So it's something that we can do with high sensitivity and specificity, I believe. So finally, I'd really like to leave you with this, um, um, this last idea that we've been developing really over the last month. If you can identify one infectious uh, disease pathogen, you can detect all of them right, with the next generation sequencing tools that are being developed now. And this can potentially act as an early warning system. So we're doing this currently with antimicrobial resistant genes. The reason we're doing this is we want to better understand what might be going on during this age of COVID-19. We know that COVID-19 is a disease that's caused by a virus, right? So typically you're not supposed to give an antibiotic for this type of condition. However, because of other comorbidities that are, that are observed in patients, clinicians often will give these antibiotics to treat those other comorbidities. And the, um, the, the, the thesis is that we're seeing uh, antimicrobial resistant uh, genes increase 
um, over time. And so we want to monitor, monitor this in Southern Nevada. So we're looking at samples from November, December, January, really the peak of COVID-19 to see whether um, these antimicrobial resistant genes alleles are present and whether or not they're increasing over time. If you can do this for AMRs, naturally you can do this for other infectious pathogens, right? And many of you might know of this, um, of this uh, virus, the norovirus, or better known as a stomach flu. We can use NGS like other groups around the world um, or have already um, been thinking about this. Um, we can use this technology to identify the virus and the different strains in the sewage. So that is absolutely key, the different strains, not just that it's there. And naturally, if you can do this for sewage um, in norovirus and sewage, you can also do this for influenza, right? We're looking at influenza A, influenza B. A rather striking feature of this, um, of this condition is that we observed very little influenza, um, um, recorded influ uh, cases of influenza in southern Nevada, probably because people have been masking up but that could be a number of different reasons also. So uh, we imagine that as time goes by, we're going to see um, influenza uh, back in Southern Nevada. And we have the tools now to inform public health officials, to inform our communities um, where highest concentrations and what type of variants are possible, uh, are present in, our, um, in the area where we live. So, here is some preliminary data showing that we can do all of this. Um, here is a list of different bacteria that we've identified in one sample. Here's a list of um, a virus, SARS-CoV-2, that we can detect in a sample. Um, there's no detection of fungi here, but we can detect antimicrobial resistant alleles. So um, we, we think that we're, we've only really started with our capabilities of this type of surveillance program. So in conclusion, um, really the last thought I, um, or so I'd like to uh, share with you about our study is, is sort of this timeline that we're looking at right now for COVID-19. Many of us are, are, are familiar with these phases, right? Where in the very beginning of last year, we saw relatively few human infections. And then we observed this sustained human to human infection before we got to the pandemic phase. Many of us would like to believe that we're in this post peak phase in the United States, right? In the United States right now, where there's still widespread human infection, but where we are away in terms of case numbers from pandemic levels. And eventually, um, we're going, many people, uh, many scientists believe that we're going to reach this post pandemic phase. Now, this post pandemic phase um, doesn't necessarily mean that um, this virus is going to go away. Um, Unfortunately, many of us predict that we're still going to see activity uh, during uh, specific times uh, in the year, perhaps in the winters, for example, like what we've been seeing uh, for influenza. Having this surveillance program in place, we will be able to know if this is merely a prediction or if this is a truth. And now we're, we have the tools to not only look whether it's there, but what types of variants are present. And again, we don't only have to do this now with SARS-CoV-2. We can do this for a whole host of pathogens. So finally, I, I'd like to sort of uh, leave you with, with where I started. Um, I had mentioned to you that we've been using diagnostic clinical samples and wastewater samples to track COVID-19 in Nevada. Um, the challenge for us really is how do you implement this system? Um, to us, it seems like a fairly um, uh, innocuous way of trying to determine uh, whether uh, communities have variants of interest and whether concentration levels are higher or lower. If folks don't get tested, we think the wastewater sample is a nice way to at least give public health officials a better sense of what we're doing. And Lanny Chang, an undergrad in the lab, really, um, I think, summarized everything that we're trying to do in the lab in this image here, wherein using wastewater samples from large wastewater treatment plants versus discrete residences, we can go out um, into other areas um, in our city, in our country, um, across the world to look for the presence of variants and of viruses in um, discrete locations. 
with that, um, thank you everyone for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Ed, that was awesome. Really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us uh, and present your research. It's super cool. Who, who knew you could do so much with poop, right? <laughs> but there is a question in the chat that I'm gonna read real quick. And let's see here. So it's from Anna. And Anna asks, the technology of detecting COVID in wastewater is clearly here. Have you run into any negative feedback from casinos or CCSD to detecting COVID in wastewater? In other words, are they open to deciding lockdowns or other measures to control virus infections? Right, right. I mean, this is a really important question, right? Um, and, and naturally, everyone wants to be sure that you have an accurate result. Um, the reality is um, we, we, we have we have the sensitivity and specificity to detect the virus. Have we run into challenges? Absolutely. But I think it's, it's par for the course. We should be running into these challenges because if we're gonna be providing actionable data um, in order for a, a building or for, you know, for 300 people to be tested, we, we better be sure about what um, the type of data that we have, right? And, um, and, and naturally, um, you know, the Clark County School District wants to be sure on how, um, how we should use this information. And I think after four weeks or so of um, collecting this information and discussing um, with, um, with the appropriate administrators, I think a, a good actional plan um, can be developed over time. Now, an important point to, 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 to remember here is that we're not, um, we're, we're not inventing this process. We're not starting from scratch. There are other uh, counties across um, the United States that are also doing this. No one has the answer yet. In fact, California and San Diego um, implemented this as early as I believe December or January with the, um, with the schools. And, um, and the results haven't been shared yet. And, and you know, I, I think the reason for this is um, I, I think most of us are trying to balance out how do we use this information to best um, service um, our communities. Um, with regards to uh, casinos, with regards to other uh, large establishments, um, we're, we're still communicating with a, with a number of different people on how do we use this information, right? Because, uh, you know, uh, being able to test 300 individuals versus 3,000 individuals, um, again, you, you want to be sure about what you're going to get out of this. And if you don't get anything out of this, um, what does it mean, right? And, and again, I, I sort of um, referred to this earlier on. There are a number of schools across the United States that implemented this wastewater surveillance program. And in several instances, uh, there was a wastewater positive result and a testing of students. But no positive uh, clinical case was identified, right? Why is that the case? Is it because the wastewater um, detection system was not sensitive enough? Or can you fully track um, um, the traffic, human traffic that's coming in and out of a building? And I think some of those challenges have to be addressed. Uh, we've known that wastewater surveillance um, has worked for infectious disease, but it's never been implemented at this scale. And all of this has really been um, thought about really hard, um, I think over a period of eight months or, or even less. Awesome, thank you. Um, any other questions? If you have any, feel free to drop them in the chat. I know uh, Dr. O, Ed is really receptive as well to emails. So if you don't think of one right now, but have one, feel free to reach out to him. And I'm sure he'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, we'll give everyone maybe a minute or two more, see if there's any final thoughts. Hi, Ed. Um, I had a question. I think uh, during your talk, you mentioned something like the real positive rate in the city is somewhere around 30 something percent based on the wastewater samples. That was really striking. Is there any other supporting evidence other than the wastewater that indicates the same kind of level. Yeah, 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 right. So 
So I, I think many of us have heard these anecdotal stories about how, gosh, um, uh, the number of confirmed cases must be higher than those that have been tested, right? Because we probably know friends or families who may have been positive with symptoms that did not get tested, right? Especially in the very beginning of this pandemic. So the expectation has always been that the number of confirmed cases must be the minimal number. So I think a lot of us um, in the community have been trying to use math and models to better predict what that number might be. Um, as of, uh, I think, May of last year, a group in Ber uh, Berkeley use uh, mathematical models to predict that at least ninefold more cases are, 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 are circulating in California. Um, and so we wanted to uh, see if we could go um, maybe an additional step um, um, in, in answering this question by using um, empirical uh, data, that being viral concentrations from wastewater. We are, I must say this, we are limited by our assumptions. And our assumption here is how much virus is being shedded through fecal material. There's a range of how much virus might be shed in fecal material. So we have to take that into consideration as we plot this estimate. If you're symptomatic or asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, you might be shedding uh, different amounts of the virus. And that's going to impact the math that we're using to predict uh, that percentage. All right, any other questions? I think we'll call it. We're, it's about five minutes after the hour, so you did great with time. And thank you so much, Dr. O, we really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, everyone. I'm gonna stop the recording.